Welcome to Deep Dive MH370, Episode 8, Surface Search. I'm Andy Tarnoff, the publisher of On Milwaukee, and I'm joined by Jeff Wise, aviation journalist. And it's time to record another one, Jeff. Welcome back. Andy, we're doing this on a Monday afternoon, and I have to say our energy level is feeling a little flagging, so we're going to have to okay. try to Let's keep amp it up a little bit. Up. Let's, but, let's, uh, let's take a go, take a little. No, more this is an important energy. episode. They're all important episodes. Uh, but yeah, we bit off a lot. Did. Last so time. I'm calling this one a little bit of a sorbet in between courses, uh, a little bit of housekeeping. I mean, we're going to talk about some important big stuff, but we're not going to blow you yeah. away with uh, math that you can't understand on this one because you might have had to watch the last one twice, and that one was so. like 47 minutes long. So. Um, I hope this one is is is, is di- fast. I, it was seven. fast to me. I hope this is a digestible one. <laughs> uh, we're calling it surface search yeah. because we're talking about yeah the search for this plane. Right. We haven't yet talked about something that was like very important at the time and really occupied people's attention. After the plane disappeared, there was a lot of um, attention on the surface search ships and airplanes, even satellites looking at the ocean surface to see if they could find the debris. And this is something that happens quite commonly when planes go missing or come to some kind of grief over the ocean. First thing you want to do is find the debris on the surface. And then that tells you more or less where the plane went, went missing. And then you can look on the seabed, see if you can find the wreckage, try to recover the black box, which has the recordings of the data, and the cockpit voice recorder, which has what people were saying to each other, and you can try to piece it together. Now, in in the case of MH370, really what was front of mind for people was Air France 447, which we've mentioned other a few times before on this podcast. 2009, Air France plane en route from Rio de Janeiro to Paris had disappeared over the middle of the Atlantic, and it took them two years to find it. First, they found the floating debris, and then that told them more or less where they should look. But still, the ocean is deep and it's big and it's a, and it's a challenging thing. It took them two years. But once they found the wreckage, they quickly located the black boxes. And with that information, we were able to know exactly what happened to that plane. And it was sort of an unusual set of circumstances, some quirky quirks. There were certainly were quirky quirks, and this is going to be kind of a visual episode. So as you know, this podcast is available on Apple Music. Uh, as an audio file, but it's also a video podcast on both YouTube and Facebook. So if you had to choose between one or the other, I would say this would be a good one to watch video because we're going to put a lot of graphics up on the screen and we're going to explain this the search radius, how it changed, uh, where it went, uh, where it started, and ultimately why they didn't really yeah. find anything. Because as we've talked about, at first everybody yeah. thought the plane crashed in the South China Sea under its original route to Beijing, and it was a search and rescue mission. mission. And that started right away. Yeah. They always start optimistically, hoping that they'll find, you know, maybe people floating in rafts or what have you. Um, and so they call it search and rescue. And then eventually it becomes recovery and just trying to, you know, find the wreckage. Um, so with this one, you know, as we know, March 8th, 2014, plane doesn't arrive in Beijing, seems to have disappeared over the South China Sea. They spent a week looking for it uh, in the South China Sea underneath the original route of the flight. Um, but then while they were still looking, there was these rumors going around that, oh, we saw it on primary radar. And they started searching um, to the west, uh, to the west of Malaysia, over the Andaman Sea, halfway between um, Malaysia and, and India. And at the time, people were like, wait a minute, why are you looking in these different places? It can't be both. Now, I, you know, Andy, I was telling you earlier today that one of the remarkable things about this case is it has so many nooks and crannies and yeah. angles to it that even now, 10 years later, I keep I keep finding new things. And the thing I found just today looking at putting this episode together, they started to search in the west, to the west of Malaysia, of Malaysia the same day that the plane disappeared. Yeah. So it wasn't like they took them a little while because it took us a few days to pe- for people to sort of the rumor to spread that, oh, actually, we saw it turn around. That's incredible. It me. is incredible. And let's, you know, let's not minimize the search equipment that was out there. I was, I was looking this up. I mean, right away, they had 28 aircraft from the People's Republic of China, uh, two of them from China, five of them from Japan, 10 of them from Malaysia, four from Singapore, one from Thailand, two from the United States, 
four from Vietnam, and then 34 vessels. So seven boats from China, 19 from Malaysia, three from Singapore, three from the United States, and two from Vietnam. So this was hardly just a couple people looking around for this thing. It was a massive effort from the get-go, from the get-go. And even just in over the South China Sea, it was a massive search. Then they also started to search, the, search this other area. And so for, and for a whole week, you've got massive searches going on in two kind of mutually exclusive areas. Why this was, it seems a little illogical, frankly. And, you know, it's easy to, you know, armchair quarterback it from 10 years later, but at the time there's a lot yeah, of Yeah, so by that second search, they had moved up to 36 aircraft and 35 vessels, more or less the same countries, um, including also United Arab, Arab Emirates and uh, New Zealand, Bangladesh. I mean, so now there are a whole bunch of people looking at this, but you're right. You, you found something new from this report in 2017. And my question to you yeah. is why were they looking where they were looking back on March 8th? Did they know something that we didn't know? And why didn't they tell us? Well, they absolutely did. I mean, we, we knew it subsequently, but you know, as I was saying, they clearly right away knew that this plane had turned around um, and that it had flown towards the Andaman Sea. Why they would continue to look in the South China Sea, um, as we've discussed, there was some confusion as to whether this plane that flipped the Malacca Strait really was the yeah. same plane. Um, so maybe that was why. But it seemed like they were high, that there was a, that there was a massive penny to drop and they kind of hit it. Do you think so. that that... But anyway, yeah, I was not, just going to say, I mean, before we start blaming Malaysia, yeah. um, do you think that they just weren't ready to make this information public and that's why it took so long? Or do you think there was gross incompetence going on here or they're just looking everywhere and hoping to find something? Like, what's your impression on, on why the information was so slow to come out and why it impeded uh, using those resources in what they believed would be the right place? Yeah, that's a great that's a great point, because by looking in the South China Sea, they weren't using those assets to look where it more likely was. I think a combination of all the things you suggest, you know, some a certain degree of incompetence, a certain degree of being caught flat footed to a certain degree, just being a culture of secretiveness. I mean, these guys were eventually thrown yeah. out of office. They were pretty incompetent and pretty corrupt. They were not great at being government officials. And they, you know, fortunately, I think eventually left. Um but I think I think it, it's one thing to say that these people were not very good at their job and another thing to, to you know, to imply that they were somehow malign right. or engaged in some kind of conspiracy. I don't think that. I don't think that they were, you know, out there trying to weave a web of deception around. I don't this think case. so either. I just don't uh, think they but were. But that, that is one job. of the reasons why people have such distrust for government and distrust for the authorities because it would be very easy to see why they were sending these search and rescue and then just recovery uh, ships and planes to the wrong place. And it was frustrating because you had the, you know, you had the Tom Nod people who are wasting their time looking around in a place where the plane right. obviously was. And, and those people were trying too. I right. mean, they were doing the best they could. It was annoying for journalists. It was annoying for journalists, but for the family members, it was another level of just it drove them crazy they were they they were in this horrible state of like not really grieving but fearing for the worst and just emotionally wrung out and here you had the, the officials not being straight with them it, it, they got very 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 angry and there were like actual like semi-violent there were protests in, in china which on. is not a place where that usually happens so um no, uh, people were pretty no. fired up and, and rightfully so. So what happens next is a little confused. I mean, I, I think I need a little bit of explanation from you as to how okay. these um, these search areas moved and why they moved there and what the rationale was for that. So on March 15th, um, as we've spent a couple episodes talking about this blockbuster news about the Inmarsat data, was released. And now we suddenly knew, okay, forget the South China Sea, forget the Andaman Sea. This plane flew for a lot longer. It either went north to Kazakhstan or went south into South China Sea. And it, from the get-go, the, the majority suspicion was with the South China Sea. They just thought it went that way and for reasons we've discussed. So where do you look? Now you've gone from these fairly small bodies of water 
um, to a vast body of water. And so they immediately dispatched airplanes. The ships take a little longer to get there. And they start looking at this area of the ocean where best guess says that the plane probably went. And we've talked before about how planes usually fly straight and high and fast. And if you assume that a plane did that, then the ping rings pretty much tell you where the plane went. And so very quickly they drew a circle in the, in the ocean and they sent planes there and the planes flew around, but only for like a couple okay. days. And then they sort of, then they started to think about it and they started to think, well, you know what? If we look at this radar data from the Malacca Straits, it seems like that plane was flying really, really fast. And if it was flying really fast, maybe it was burning fuel faster than we expected. So that means it had would have had less fuel, so it would have to fly more efficiently, and so it would have to fly slower. And to make slow speeds work with the ping ring, you get a curved path that goes further to the north. Okay. Now, we can talk about this more, but the, but the upshot of it is that a curving path to the north is really unlikely. It's possible, but it's unlikely. And so they, they took their search planes away from an area that turned out to be really like the best most probable place where the plane went and started looking in some really low probability areas because they had kind of yeah, stuck themselves Tell me out. why flying a curved route is less efficient or less likely than flying a straight line. The, so as I said, the, um, the, the rings tell you how, how uh, fast a straight flight is and that, and that also tells you where it went. And so everyone assumes if they look at the data Oh, that's what happened to it. That's how planes fly. But it's also possible to fly more slowly. Um, you can still connect your 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 distance traveled to the space between the rings if you curve, if you go at an angle between each ring. And the problem with that is that if you allow the plane to fly in different mm -hmm. ways, meaning if you say, okay, I'm going to allow this, I'm going to imagine this this plane, instead of flying straight, which any, like, if you were flying a jet over the ocean at night, there's no reason to turn. There's nothing to right. avoid. There's nothing, there's no way that, like, your objective change or something. There's, there's no reason to fly in a curve. And so if, you start, so if you start to open that possibility up and say, okay, let's say every, and so the, 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 the search investigators did this kind of math game. They're like, okay, let's allow it to make a 10 degree turn every 30 okay. minutes or something. Or let's make it maybe a 50 degree turn every 20 minutes. And so the more you open up the possibilities, the, the universe of possible ways that a plane could fly, if you allow this kind of behavior, expands exponentially, right? And so you get all kinds of potential behaviors. That, and, you, and, and so the idea is that of all these thousands of things that could have happened if you allow this kind of behavior, it just coincidentally wound up flying a route that matched the straight. So, so it would almost be like if you knew the ping rings were there and you were trying to hit them, you 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 might right. do something like exactly. that. But if you didn't know the ping rings were there, it would be a very illogical way of flying a plane over the ocean. Yeah. So a lot of people, I think, came up with the idea of like, well, maybe he was trying to be deceptive and he was trying to match the he was trying to fly in a way that made it look like he was going straight and fast, but he was really going curved things. A really, really, really important thing to understand based on what we've been talking about in previous episodes is that there's no way that if Zahari took this plane, he would have had any idea about ping rings and BFO value. BFO He would have had to have been like a Doppler mind reader to, to, to know that these breadcrumbs were lost. So it makes me sort of feel like that kind of level of um, trickery. He would literally have to be a really mind make sense. He would have had to be we have to assume that there's no way he could have known about the ping rings because don't forget, even within the satellite communications industry, which is a very specialized yeah. industry that he did yeah. not belong to, nobody knew that they were recording this BTO data. So he would have absolutely no reason to think that they were recording it. So the, so the analogy that I was telling you about earlier is why is it unlikely that it was a curved path? And I said, OK, imagine we're in this town <laughs> where there's two I, bars. I like this one. Right? This is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You like this Come one? On. Okay. Um, so there's Andy's bar and there's Jeff's bar. And in Andy's bar, it's very straight. You just pay $5 for every beer. And at Jeff's bar, it's a little wacky. I make you roll a die, and that's how many dollars you pay for a beer. So it's either $1 or it's $6. And I've been to bars $5. Like that, by the way. All right. 
Yeah, there, yes. It's very common. It's very Maybe common. in the mid, it's oh, a Midwest thing, but yes, it's so people can oh, hopefully Midwest. people anywhere okay. can understand this analogy. Okay, so then your wife looks at your your uh, yeah. credit card bill at the end of the month, and she sees how much money you've been spending on beer every day. And you're actually not that much of an alcoholic. You only had one beer per day, and this is how much you drank. You drank five dollars, 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 and five dollars. Sure. Right. So Andy. Seeing that bill, which bar did that the guy, guy went go to Andy's to Andy's bar for sure? For totally. sure, right? Because that's the telltale sign of Andy's bar. It's always bar. five dollars. But, but wait, wait there's yeah. more because it's not actually true. It's very, very high probability that he went to Andy's bar, but there's a another way to get it. He could have gone to Jeff's bar and just by chance rolled a five every single time. Now, if you're a normal person, you're like that's ridiculous. That's incredibly unlikely. And indeed, the probability of that happening is one sixth to the exponent of however many times it goes to the bar. So it's and, and that quickly gets to zero, close to zero. Doesn't you could pull never it off zero, for a couple of days. It's really in a row close to zero. Really quick. Super lucky or really great at rolling dice. But if you for a whole month, yeah, that's so it's one sixth yeah. on the first day. It's one thirty sixth uh-huh. on the second day, and, on, and it's and like on, less than I don't know. My my math but it is gets to the higher. point where it's one in two hundred. It's not really going to happen. It'd be like flipping a coin, but it's but it happened to have six sides and always getting the same result, like over and over again. Right. So the the more latitude you the more the more um, turns and changes of speed you allow a plane to have, in, 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 in when you're imagining what this plane could have done. It's like going to the bar more and more days. And so to get to a really far, the further north you go, the more rolls of the dice you have to get in order to make it look like it was straight and fast, but it was really doing all these other crazy and things. And the reason we're telling people this is because they were looking for places that didn't really align with the data, right? They were looking for places that made sense from a fuel burn and just assumed that somehow they would make, a, make the, the, the math of the turns work yeah. out. And so they were, and so, but the reason this matters is that they were searching with boats and with planes, an area that was much further north than probably they should have had any, any reason. And looking. sure enough, they didn't find anything. And time went right? by. They didn't see anything. And so you have to, and so, but in the course of moving the, the search area really far north, they actually, they started looking at dead center in the, in the heart of where the high probability zone turned out to be. And then they skipped a pretty good zone. That, that had a pretty high probability, and they went to some stuff that had a really low probability. So the fact that they didn't spot anything from, from the air might be that they just were looking in the wrong place. Now you've moved on to the Australians sure. who are running the show. That's true. I might have expected that from Malaysia. I feel like Australia would be more competent in its search for uh, why. I think that the Australians had resources that the Malaysians didn't. They have an Air Transport Safety Bureau that's pretty active. It's pretty good. I'm, I'm genuinely impressed by the quality of their work. Um, they also rushed to some cl- conclusions, as we'll see as we talk about what we're talking about today, that were not, not great. Um, but, but this was only because they, the Australians didn't really ask for it. It's just that the, once the Inmarsat data suggested an endpoint in the Southern Indian Ocean, that lies within... Australia's kind of global search and rescue okay. responsibility area. Maybe maybe the fault here is ex- expecting too much from too many people. It's it was a very novel situation. It's it, it, it's a very challenging um, task to try to solve a kind of mystery, the likes of which has never been seen before. Um, and so we're still learning. We're obviously we're still learning from it. We still haven't found the plane, but hopefully our conversation in this podcast will, okay. will help well, somehow. So so part um, so part two of this episode is the acoustic search for the underwater right. pings, and that, that that loops back into this a little right. bit because on right. April second they began looking for the the black box, if I'm understanding this correctly, right. and the and the reason yeah. they did that was because of how long the batteries in the black box would continue to operate. And they did it all the way until exactly. April 7, 2014. As we were saying, what you want to do is find the surface debris floating around, and then you, and then you can um, try to find this, the wreckage on the, sur- on, the, on the bottom of the ocean. Now, to help you do that, 
the black boxes are equipped with these devices that when submerged will detect that they're submerged and start to emit an acoustic signal, a ping, an audible ping. It's actually too high for the human ear to hear, but it's like a sound, all right? And um, so your dog can probably hear it maybe. I don't know, I'm speculating. But, so, but the battery for these um, acoustic pingers only lasts for a month. And so they, they were yeah, running out of time. Two questions about this. Something, something I've, okay. I don't know if you even know the answer to this, but th these are things that I've always wondered uh, just as a civilian. Um, first of all, why does the battery not last longer? Is it just the, um, the technology with the underwater pressure? I mean, like, like do they, they really can't make a black box that the battery lasts longer? Or is it people expect to find the plane within a month and that's, that's all they got? Well, with anything in an aircraft, you're making a, uh, a trade-off between weight and function, right? So you could have a battery that lasts any amount of time you want, but it has to, the, the weight would be commensurate with that thing. And the, I think, the thinking is, okay, if a plane crashes in the water, we're going to, there's no way it's going to take us a month okay. to find it. Um, MA370 is very strange in that regard. So, so that's the reason why it's, it only had a month. Do more current, do more current planes or more recent built planes to their batteries last longer? Or is that still kind of the best practice that they last for a month? I'm pretty sure it's the That's same. Good. I don't think that, well, and there's another reason why they wouldn't change it, which is that Air France 447, yeah. as I was talking about at the beginning of the episode, one of the reasons it took them so long to find it was that when they started looking on the seabed, they assumed that the black box pinger would be working. And so the fact that they hadn't detected the black box pinger meant that it couldn't have been in the, in the central area. So that was area. my second question, yeah. And so, um, so, yeah. And so it didn't work then. It might yeah. have just broken. We don't even so know why So assuming a black box is functional, black, um, how, how far does it spread its ping, do you know? So it's about a mile yeah. or two, something on that scale. And if you think that this water could be three right. miles deep, that's problematic. So you have to actually dangle something on a on a line and drag it like underwater to try to detect it. So it's it's not great, but it's a lot better than not having any pinger okay. at all, where you have to actually physically you know put your scanner right over the actual okay. wreckage. So they were hoping that they could save themselves a lot of grief if they could detect okay. this pinger. So we have some details within uh, that, and and uh, we're talking about we're talking about radio frequencies again. No, or we're not. Sonic, Definitely sonic not. frequencies? It's, it's, it's confusing because we're, because we're talking about ping rings, which have to do with radar and we're, uh, radio signals, and we're talking about pingers, which are acoustic. They are sound traveling through the water. It's very confusing. My apologies. Well, um, that's okay if I didn't beast. get it, but what we do know is there is a frequency of 37.5 kilohertz, and that is a very specific number right. that is assigned to black boxes. Now, remember, they had calculated that this plane was somewhere in the seventh arc, but they didn't really know where. They'd been moving the search area up and down over the previous weeks, and they were running out of time. So they said, okay, you know what? We've got to just try. So let's lower a detector into the water and see if we hear anything. And lo and behold, they heard something. <laughs> now, me, I was, I remember at this time, I was still going on CNN all the time. I was like, you're kidding me. Are you saying you just got that lucky right off the bat? I was suspicious. I'm a suspicious guy. Um, and but over the over the days that followed, they they said, "Oh, we heard it. We heard it again. We heard it again." But there were a couple of things that I found weird about this. One, and they got but they got very excited. This is like yeah, we have a couple clips it. of this too. Um, that we're in fact, play they, right now, uh, Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott. We have a video of you talking to Don Lemon. Um, but summarize it for right. me, please. So most people who are, are, who are more optimistic by nature were like, okay, great, we solved it. Because remember, we, were all, we already pulled off the incredible feat. We got, I mean, they didn't talk about how lucky they were, they were that, these, that these numbers existed. You and I have been talking about it. They got really lucky that they had these numbers. They were impressed that they performed the, pr the prodigious feat of figuring out the math and, and calculated where it went. And now they, they got lucky by putting the, the thing in the water and they heard it. So like, we are just so lucky and so good. And they were, everyone was completely convinced. I was going on CNN and like talk, all these people were like, yeah, we found the plane. Okay, it's, all, it's just, all we have to do is like go find the pingers, find the black box, this is done, done and dusted. And I was like, don't be so quick. Anyway, they, they detected these pingers, but there, there were a couple of things that made, made me okay. suspicious. One is that the, 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 the location of the detections were like miles and miles apart. 
Now, this thing isn't moving around. It didn't land on the back of a giant turtle, and it's been yeah. walking around. So how could this stationary object be, de be detected 10 miles apart when it only has a range of two miles? The other thing is that the frequency was wrong. It was, it was, pinging, it was being detected at 33 kilohertz. And these things are just, and you're like, oh, 33, I don't know, 33, 33, 37, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty no. similar. These things are probably, probably designed with, a, uh, with it, an error of less than 1%. Okay, and and 33 from 37.5 is like 10%. And it's way, there's just no way. It cannot be, it cannot be the same thing. And I got, I went on air and it got very contentious. In fact, at one point there was almost like a fist fight in the green room cool. after after his show because people were so annoyed. Uh, so so but, people are saying like, don't worry about it. If it's 33 or 37 and a half, it's probably the same thing or, or just were they not thinking about it? People are telling themselves all kinds yeah. of stories. People are telling themselves stories to justify how this could be. And I actually went on a segment with um, Bill Nye, the science guy, and he says, oh, you know, there's this thing called refraction. If you have two bodies of water that are slightly different, like salt yeah. density, the, the wave will get bent and that'll change the frequency. I was going to ask you about I'm that. Like, you're, you're Mr. That's science. That's not how it works, huh? You're, you're, you're the science guy? Hmm. That's not how it works. Refraction does not change the frequency. You know, it... It, uh, well, it, no. I mean, and it's it, not like not right. there haven't been black boxes found at the bottom of the ocean before, and those had the correct frequency. Well, the, yeah, I, I, it, it, to, to make a long story short, it was okay. impossible. But nobody wanted to okay. hear that. And so, but that to me was like, it was scary to me, Andy, because I was on TV. I was being seen by, you know, potentially millions of people. And I'm saying all y'alls are wrong. It, what yeah, you're saying is just wrong. It seems like there was wrong. a whole lot of that and, going on back then, and that must have been a really frustrating time for you. I mean, we talked before about how I thought it went north and then I realized yeah. I was wrong and I had yeah. to walk it back and it was yeah. embarrassing. But then this time I kind of redeemed myself because it turned out I was right because they looked and they looked and it wasn't there. They finally searched that seabed where they heard the pings and there was nothing. So what do they think it was? They never said, they, you know what, they just, they were wrong and they just kind of let it go. And I think we're going to see this pattern later where like authorities are going to make these big promises and then when those big promises don't pan out, they just let it kind of slide. So they never the explained. There's never it was a, like a an announcement or a whale or just just poof. Just move on. We'll go on to the next thing. I mean, there's people did speculate. There are like tags that people put on like marine mammals or sea turtles or try to yeah. track them or um, and, and that they'd have us they'd have all kinds of different frequencies. So it might have been something like that. Um, I think the theory that. Um, that has been floated. In fact, um, you know, the lieutenant that we talked to in the first episode, he said that they that they that he thinks that they detected their own equipment, that the that they that they had like a test mode that generated like a test frequency, and that that's oh, what they detected. That they like set off their own equipment, and that is pretty plausible actually. Um, I... It sucks. It sucks. But you know. But they just they just sort of let it slide, and then like a month later or two months later, the U.S. Navy said, "Oh, by the way, it wasn't it. It wasn't uh, just that." Just as a side, because you know my role here is media guy, publisher guy. Uh, was CNN getting a little tired of putting you on the air and paying you for this? I assume after after you continued to <laughs> to be the contrarian who <laughs> they couldn't. I, I don't know. Like, were they like, "Who is this guy, and why do I, I keep putting this did. guy?" I on? Mean, from a media perspective, I had been put on air without anybody at any point explaining to me what I was supposed oh. to be doing. I would just be told to come to the studio. They'd mic me up. I'd go sit in the chair. The camera would have the little red light would come on, and they would ask me a question. And I and I never knew what they were going to ask me. And sometimes the premise of the question was wrong, and I'd have to like say, actually, the premise of your question is wrong. But but I they I, as I talked about earlier, when I got excited about narrowing the, the where the plane could have gone, I they didn't. I I tried to tell them like new stuff that I'd found, and they really didn't want to hear about it. Um, I, and I think the people that they liked the most were the people who simply like said the same information in a different way. The way that a, that a TV um, brought, you know news person, the, the problem that they're dealing with is that they want to break it up. They don't want to just say this, have the same people saying the same thing over and over again. And so what they'll do is they'll say, you know, um, you know, uh, sources are reporting X. 
Um, and and then here we have um, Jeff Wise in the studio to talk about X. Jeff, what are your sources telling you about X? And I say, oh. well, X. <laughs> My sources yeah. are also telling me X. You know what I mean? And so they basically, they basically want to kind of keep to the same script, but just have different voices sort of saying it from maybe a different angle. And I was kind of coming in there being like, guys, you're like, you've got it, you've got it all wrong. <laughs> That's not really what they wanted to. I think they sometimes found it entertaining. And I, but I will tell you this: Richard Quest, yeah. who I was going on with all the time, he really disagreed yeah. with me yeah. fundamentally about this case. But the one thing that he gives me credit for is he wrote a book about it later, and he said, like Jeff, uh, you know, got over his skis. He said about some of my ideas. But the thing that I got right was that I said the the pingers, the acoustic pingers were not. We should get this guy on this podcast. And I was right. We should yeah. get a lot of people. You know, I was thinking uh, that too, actually. And Don Lemon too. I don't know. I mean, he's got some great? free time these days. I think. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'll stop making fun of CNN. But if we're gonna try to invite somebody on the podcast, we have to be. Oh, nice. we're totally gonna be nice. And oh, by the way, I did try to um, invite yeah. Victor. Anello on the podcast. And I know. I saw you asked him on Twitter. He, did, he so, demurred. That's okay. fine. That's fine. We know what he thinks. He, and we're, I think we're. I think we're accurately portraying what he says, and giving him. Credit I don't know what kind of enemies you've credit. made, but those people are mad at you, Jeff. People are mad at me. You seem like That's a really true. nice and guy. I, and I, I, I've known you now for a while, and I just you. don't see that side of you. People are mad at me not because I'm a. Well, okay. There were some things that I've done that okay. were kind of jerky, and I will okay. talk about those. But um. But it's not because I, th- I and I have been accused of like being a liar, but mm-hmm. I'm not. Um, and but I think people are mostly mad at me because I don't agree with their theory. And I get lots of people writing me on Twitter saying like you're a jerk or all the different versions of jerk that you can think of. Um, and it's mostly because they're mad at me because I don't. Well, I hope people idea. aren't. And I, I hope and people I, aren't reading and. I don't want people to have an idea. I don't want people to think, oh, this is... A lot of people are like, oh, that's not... I don't think that's what happened. I'm like, I don't <laughs> care what you think happened. I, I want to talk about what the evidence is and the different... What are the... Let's talk about all the different hypotheses that could conceivably but match again, the in this podcast, we we're not saying we have every single answer and we have... And at the end, we're going to tell you exactly what happened to a T. We think we know. We've, we've done a lot of research no, and we're we going to go in a certain gonna... direction. But... I, this isn't a lecture. We but we are gonna we are gonna tell you what didn't yes. happen, and people get mad about that. And lately, people are mad at me because there's video circulating about UFOs taking MH370 through a portal to another dimension. And I say, and I said to somebody today, I said portals aren't real. Portals are things that happen in in Marvel movies and comic. Okay. So if they want to be mad at books, us they're... over the UFO portal, I can live with that. But if it's for the other stuff, I think okay. it's uh, we're talking about it and we welcome other voices on. Is it, Obviously, I want them to be rational and polite and respectful. Um, I don't right. want to have a podcast with a bunch right. of people screaming at each other and insulting each other, but I, w- I would love to have this Victor guy. I don't know him, right. but he sounds pretty smart and I'd like to have him and I'd like to have Anyone else of, of some of some sort of expertise to come tell us that we're full of it or that we're on the right path? There aren't a ton of people who really understand the data. And so even if they don't like me or, or think I'm way off base, I am always happy to listen to them because they can tell us stuff that is true um, and that we might not know. Um, so I'm all in favor of that. I think we should wrap up talking about the acoustic pinger. I think we pretty much did. This was the kind of the end of the attempt to find it um, either on the surface or just the easy way by listening for it. Because once those two options go away, you, you only have you have a very daunting task ahead of you, which is to try to figure out through math more precisely where it went, and then scan. And I think uh, we made this episode not terribly technical, and I don't think there's a ton that people would disagree with on this, although I'm sure that someone will always find something to disagree with. But no doubt it was some sort of wild uh, goose chase, and it took the officials until, you said, late May to start to realize that this was not working out so well. We learned something, which is that the authorities can say that they're very, very confident of something, and they're wrong. And it's not because they're bad people or they're incompetent. It's just that they can they can get ahead of themselves. And I, we, as we saw before, I can get ahead of myself. People make mistakes. We're human. We're trying to do this thing. But just because someone with a fancy title um, says that they're absolutely sure that something is true, 
it might not be. So you have to just follow your own sense of what, uh, how, of how the science works and okay. make your case. What do you want to talk about in episode nine? I, in episode nine, I want to talk about the pilot because by this point, the authorities are pretty much convinced that the only explanation for how this plan could have gotten into the Southern Indian Ocean is that the captain, Zahari Ahmad Shah, must have planned this elaborate suicide mission. So if that's true, then who is this guy? Why, why might he have done it? What's his personality? What was his life circumstances? How can we try to understand psychologically why okay, somebody might so have we'll done this? So we'll take a deep dive into the pilot. In the meantime, you right. have been watching this or listening to this on a variety of different sources. So obviously, we would love it if you would be liking, subscribing, rating, telling your friends, uh, giving us feedback. As you know, we reply to it. We read it. We're pretty easy to get a hold of. Yeah. Uh, it helps us make a better podcast. People are telling us stuff that we didn't know. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even nine and a half years later, people are telling us stuff that we Isn't didn't cool? know and or, or raising points that are valid. And like, this is a conversation. Science is a conversation. And we don't, I'm not here to just kind of like lay out the truth one way. It's, I want to hear from you. Um, and it also just is very encouraging to see that, that we're, that we're reaching to people. Um, and so people are, are, are writing very nice notes and comments and just, and some people are, subs are subscribing on our um, show page, MH, deep dive mh370.com which is a sub stack you, you can subscribe, which is which really does a lot to encourage us and gives us some resources to help it us. It does. The and we've even been dabbling in YouTube shorts and some inter interstitial in between right. episode uh, content. And we're going to keep on doing that uh, with with more more support from our viewers and listeners. And, and we appreciate it. We're having a great time doing this. This is serious stuff, but it's it's yeah. also fascinating. And we hope we continue to yeah. improve the product as we go. I'll see you next week. Yeah. Keep it going. Thanks, Andy, and thanks, uh, thanks to you guys out there, and we'll uh, Thank we'll see you, you soon.